Okay, our next speaker is Jonathan Hill. He's of Council and Cooley's uh, Regulatory Aviation Practice Group in Washington, D.C., so he's made the trip up here, and we thank him for that. Um, together with our next speaker, John McGraw, uh, <clears throat> Jonathan filed seven of the first eight Section 333 applications to authorize commercial operations of UAVs in the television and movie industry. Hillary mentioned that. And uh, Mr. Hill filed eight applications for approval of precision aerial survey work, and all of the applications were granted. Um, he advises companies and individuals wishing to enter the commercial unmanned aerial systems market on regulatory matters. He's an active pilot since 1964. He holds a commercial pilot's rating, multi-engine land, private pilot rating, single engine land and sea. He is an instrument rated and flies regularly. So without further ado, Jonathan. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Hillary gave us a great overview of the regulatory structure and the legal structure. There are all sorts of issues that arise out of that, uh, such as preemption, and uh, uh, which raise you know complicated issues. But the state regula regulation of UAVs uh, is going to be impacted by what the federal government does, and the authority of the federal government in general will supersede the state regulations. This will be a uh, a major shakeout in the years to come and privacy will, uh, will be a constant fight. Uh, one of the issues that uh, I worry about for the industry generally is if we're going to regulate privacy, the level of regulation is just going to go way up. It's going to be harder and harder to do this job, this industry, which is at, sort of at the very beginning and is sort of in a chaotic situation where there, people are trying to find a way to make money doing this. Big, big industry is saying, well, the government's not paying anymore for the global hawks, so how can I use that commercially? And uh, the small guy is trying to find a way in. Another layer of regulation is going to be tough. So we re really need to think about uh, the state regulatory efforts and how they interface with the federal government. Uh, but that's not what I'm here to talk about. So. Um, as indicated, we have filed a lot of these applications. I think at last count, we have filed 40 exemption applications, most of them with John McGraw and I teaming up to do this. And uh, we have had a fair amount of experience uh, in this area. Um, today, I've been asked to talk to you about a litigation uh, arising with UASs. And it's a rather short subject. Um, if you limit it as I have. Uh, I have not tried to get into privacy issues uh, because that tends to be state level and it, it will be developing over time. But in any event, if this will work, um, as Hillary did, I think the first thing to think about is what is the size of this industry that we're, uh, we're talking and I can see I said marker size, it's market size that I wanted to say up there. Um, <clears throat> The DOT, which is as good as anybody at guessing at what the size of this industry is going to be, <clears throat> suggested in 2013 that by 2035, <clears throat> the federal fleet would be 10,000 UASs. Uh, the Department of Defense, they estimated, would grow to 14,000 UASs of all sizes and 5,000 uh, augmented pilot or optional pilot vehicles in the same time period. And then they came up with a number of 175,000 civil commercial uh, uses, uh, users. But what this ignores, of course, is the hobbyist market, which is a gigantic. There's probably that many out there already flying around. Uh, and as I will talk to you in a minute, the theme that I wanted to leave with you on this <coughs> uh, discussion of litigation is that <coughs> the hobbyists are the least regulated because Congress has restricted the FAA's ability to regulate them. And they pose the biggest threat, I think, in the current environment to commercial operations uh, because of their unregulated nature. We've already seen them flying into the White House. Uh, in Japan, they flew into the legislature. Uh, there are numerous examples at some point, something bad is going to happen with one of these aircraft, and then Congress is going to step back in and change the world. So um, as I said, I'm going to discuss 
uh, discuss <coughs> civil court, uh, federal court litigation, administrative litigation, uh, <coughs> and I'm not talking about trespass privacy issues that Hillary alluded to. The starting point is uh, our UAS is aircraft, and uh, this has recently been answered at least at the administrative level that, uh, and the statute uh, which I cite here describes an aircraft as any contrivance invented, used, or designed to navigate uh, or fly in the air. And uh, that is uh, the FAA's enabling legislation. Uh, <clears throat> some litigation has arisen as the result <coughs> of hobbyists flying uh, these aircraft, most notably at the University of Virginia, which resulted in the FAA to trying to impose a $10,000 fine. And, and so you people won't go to sleep. I'm going to try to run this video, which is now running, and uh, take a break. What you want to see in this is, while it's a lot of fun and it's a slick production, uh, this is the kind of activity that gives the FAA a lot of problems and may someday give the uh, Congress uh, a wake-up call. You can tick off the number of FAA regulations that are being violated second by second here. Uh, and it gets better, so, you know, hang on. I apologize if you've all seen this before, but it's on the internet, so I thought you'd be enjoying it. Here we go, under a bridge. Yeah, it's, uh, we're flying over, you know, uh, 91 and 119 prohibits any of this operation period right here and the discussion. So. Another bridge. We crash it in a minute here too. Hmm? Well, I'll get to That's the third bridge, and here comes the crash, I think, yeah. Whoa, bang. Missed that guy. It's too bad. Uh, this was filmed, evidently, as I understand it, uh, as a potential commercial operation uh, without an exemption. And the FAA uh, determined uh, to try to impose a $10,000 civil penalty on this. And it got a lot of press. You've all read about it. Uh, an administrative law judge at the National Transportation Safety Board, which is the uh, appeal level, uh, ruled in favor of the operator and said that uh, the FAA did not have jurisdiction. It was appealed to the full board, and the full board very quickly and correctly, in my view, found that this was an aircraft. The FAA has jurisdiction, and they remanded it for a trial as to whether this is careless and reckless operation, which I'm sure you don't think it is. So uh, when that, uh, when the, uh, Mr. Perker, who is the individual applying this, uh, at that point decided to settle, and the case was settled for $1,200 or something like that, it's a civil penalty, which I think is a, a little amazing, um, that from a standpoint, I think the FAA would want to make a, a bigger deal out of this, but that's, that's where it is. Um, as I say, if you're interested in reading this, the Perker case is there. There's a citation. They, um, they found violation of 9113 careless and reckless operation. So the other piece of litigation that was around <coughs> in uh, the Federal Circuit is the Texas EquiSearch Mounted Search and Recovery Team versus the FAA. This was a, a lawsuit filed in the Court of Appeals of the District of Columbia. Uh, Equus, EquiSearch provided assistance in searching for missing persons in Texas and wanted to use UASs to do so. Uh, the FAA, <coughs> through an inspector, advised EquiSearch 
they couldn't, uh, since they weren't using this as a hobby or recreational purposes, they could not do so without an exemption. Uh, Equisearch decided that was not what they wanted to hear, so they brought suit. And um, uh, the court, at the request of the FAA, dismissed the litigation because uh, no formal order, cease and desist order, was issued by the FAA uh, to uh, uh, stop the, uh, the uh, flights. Uh, the court determined that you had to have a final order to appeal it. It's a technical legal decision, but uh, the FAA, again, pr prevailed on that. Uh, the Perker case, which is the one that's gotten the most uh, coverage, uh, resulted in May of April of this year in the FAA issuing a national policy uh, related to aviation-related videos and other electronic media on the Internet. Uh, as my colleague here said, Exhibit 1 uh, was uh, for a prosecution. Resulted in this. Um, it noted that aerial vehicles are frequently subjects of videos. FAA inspectors are free to investigate said vi videos and to send information, information letters to pursue enforcement actions, uh, but the inspectors must have evidence and video of the video and not only with the video of the violations. The videos have to be authenticated, uh, the normal sort of things that you would do uh, in a litigation environment. Um, uh, post, they did determine, though, that the posting of a video like that does not cons constitute a commercial operation or a commercial purpose or a non-hobby use. Uh, FAA, faced with the issues of uh, uh, hobby flying and the potential dangers of it, issued another order in July of last year, which uh, provided uh, guidance on the primary effort, which is to educate hobby and recreational users, um, but reserved to the FAA the right to bring civil enforcement actions, which uh, the only one I know of is, is the Perker case. Uh, I'm sure there are probably several in the pipeline at the moment we just haven't seen. Um, the FAA <coughs> has uh, civil enforcement authority it does not have criminal enforcement authority. It has to go to the U.S. attorneys to do that. It's rarely used. Uh, they've provided guidance to state and local law enforcement agencies uh, about UASs uh, in an effort to try to standardize uh, enforcement efforts. Uh, and that material is, uh, is available on the Internet if it's of, of interest to you. Uh, Hillary mentioned public aircraft. I would just uh, indicate here that uh, in order for uh, a state or a government to fly one of these aircraft, they have to undertake a governmental function. And this has been one of the litigation issues at the FAA that has surfaced. A governmental function is an activity undertaken by a government such as national defense, intelligence missions, firefighting, law enforcement, aeronautical research, and biological ge geological research efforts. Um, some of the public entities have tried to bootstrap, namely universities mostly, tried to bootstrap uh, their flying under the public aircraft exception uh, in, into a money-making effort and have offered s such things as teaching flying for UAVs, and the FAA has cracked down on that. Uh, indicating that uh, teaching, uh, the only thing that can be done is research, and it has to be uh, research in the aeronautical area to qualify for, for um, public use aircraft. Uh, hobby, and aircraft hobby and model aircraft, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, is the third group uh, that is not regulated, uh, and this under three, Section 336. C of the Modernization Reform Act, uh, the FAA is prohibited from issuing any regulations, uh, for instance, uh, addressing pilot training, pilot knowledge, uh, certification of aircraft. Uh, and so if you have, uh, if you're flying for a hobby use, the only thing that you really can be, have to be worried about is careless and reckless operation that the FAA would come back to. Uh, as I indicated to you, I think uh, 
that, that, that risk is rather minimal at the moment. The FAA is, continues to be understaffed. They don't have in, uh, people out who can follow this material, find out what's going on. Uh, commercial operators, in my opinion, are probably not the issue because commercial operators are going to take the time and effort to operate in a lawful manner because they're trying to make money off of this. And uh, the hobby and recreational operator, the guy who flies it over the White House, flies into somebody else's backyard, are the ones that are someday are going to require Congress to rethink the exemption to them. So I'll be glad to ask any questions.